is uh, indicate that uh, either by uh, just letting us know either through the email or by you can just talk and let us know. Uh, so we will uh, uh, start. Uh, we are having this uh, session in English uh, because there was a request to have it in English. Uh, after we had a three session um, discussion in three separate days uh, for about six hours uh, in uh, Sinhalese. So this is not going to be just a repetition of that in English, but uh, I will try to uh, focus on some important issues in understanding uh, human rights, particularly from the point of view of, uh, uh, you know, relating into our local conditions. Uh, secondly, uh, in a way that uh, the, we can also better understand the, uh, the sustainable development goals for 2030 and what the human rights uh, groups could do uh, in that uh, regard. As you know, uh, the uh, human rights is based on as a universal concept. A universal concept means that there are certain uh, rights that are applicable to uh, anybody uh, anywhere in any country, irrespective of what the country is or what the culture is. Uh, now the uh, second part of this is when it comes to practical terms, we have to relate it to our country conditions, not for the purpose of modifying rights, but to deal with the problems of implementation. Implementation is a practical affair, and uh, the possibilities depends on the kind of uh, local systems uh, that are uh, that exist. Uh, if the local systems do not uh, help promotion of human rights, then we will be left with some good ideas uh, without much practical value. So that is why we need to uh, always. Uh, to see in the application of those principles uh, how much is possible within the present circumstances and what are the obstacles and are there ways to overcoming these obstacles and the questions like that. So uh, first of all, uh, let's go back to the foundational principles uh, on which the human rights is based. Uh, foundational principles are those principles on which uh, the rights finds explanation. Why, if somebody asks, why do why do we say that we have a right to life, or why we have a right to a, a remedy? For example, if something wrong happens, uh, that we have a right expect from the state that they will do everything possible to correct it. How can we have that expectation? What is the basis? So foundational rights have, are of course at the end uh, uh, philosophical principles. Certain agreed upon philosophical uh, uh, principles. And these philosophical principles are also uh, not merely a uh, product of 
philosophical thinking, but they are also a product of history. There had been many uh, struggles throughout history in order to establish the validity of these uh, uh, principles. Later, we will explain by examples, we will try to explain this. So first, the three most important um, foundational principles are the principle of human dignity, the principle of uh, equality, and the principle of uh, liberty. These are the three important uh, uh, principles. Uh, the idea of the, what is called fraternity is uh, really embedded in the first three principles. So if we discuss these three principles, then we can more or less come into a deeper understanding of what these uh, talk about rights are. The out of these three uh, principles arises another principle that is right to justice. So, uh, equality, uh, sorry, uh, dignity, equality, liberty, and uh, justice. These are the most basic and foundational principles around which we have to uh, discuss all the uh, uh, problems that come up in relation to human rights. A lot of problems do come up in terms of human rights. When we say these are universal principles, that does not mean everybody accepts these as principles. There are many, for various reasons, do not accept these as principles particularly those who oppose most uh, to these principles are the, uh, uh, from the uh, various uh, the executive branches of uh, governments. There is a reason for that. The executive has to do things. And they find these rights are an obstacle to the way they want to do things, then they want to modify or suspend rights. There are, of course, other uh, uh, people who object to rights also. That is from various ideological points of view. Uh, some people uh, uh, believe that only some uh, one section of people have rights. The uh, uh, in a, you know in a socialist settings, in the classical type, the, uh, only the rights of the what is called the proletariat is recognized, and others are regarded as people who have no rights. And therefore, even uh, killing them uh, is uh, justified. That's one ideological uh, 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 group. Then there are many other forms of ideologies from the other side. That is, from the more capitalist type of uh, developments, uh, like, for example, libertarianism, which will say that, uh, you know, the, the rich have a, a right to do whatever with the, in order to make more wealth. And uh, there should be no ob uh, uh, obstacles on the way. So they will say that social justice is an obstacle. And many of the rights, as we know, are based on the idea of social justice. So they will say uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, we are opposed to these rights because 
they are opposed to our right to acquire and to keep, um, make uh, wealth without limitations. So these are just I'm uh, in broadly mentioning, uh, uh, introducing to you because if you are seriously working on this, uh, thinking these things, this will become useful. Now what we can begin is, are these foundational principles that we mentioned earlier, part of uh, our culture, our society? Now you know that there is a heavy ideological uh, attack by some people for with good faith or without good faith, depending on the person, that the uh, these are not part of our culture. Uh, the these are parts of the Western culture, and therefore, uh, is a, it is not uh, uh, suitable to us. Since this objection is raised very often, we need to really to understand whether there is some truth in that, or we must be able to answer it in a reasonable way to show that this idea is not valid. So for that purpose, I will take you briefly into different uh, uh, times broadly speaking, different times of our history, uh, that is Sri Lankan history. Uh, these uh, times can be broadly categorized as the period before the agriculture uh, uh, emerged in Sri Lanka, uh, which is also called the period of prehistory. This is very, uh, in terms of a uh, lot of discoveries, that have been made by prehistorians, archaeologists, and them. Uh, on this, we have a lot of lot more information uh, than ever before. And I think in the future, uh, discussions of uh, history will dramatically change in Sri Lanka in terms of these discoveries. So we will go into that how that is relevant for the discussion on human rights. Second part is the uh, uh, second stage is when the agriculture emerged as the main form of production in uh, Sri Lanka. That can be divided into uh, two parts. That is when there was collective agriculture. That the people who emerged from the forest, having uh, discovered that various plants can be replanted in an orderly way, and uh, make uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, things like food uh, items and uh, uh, also even uh, certain uh, uh, you know aesthetic uh, things of aesthetic value like for example what uh, people wear to uh, give some beauty to themselves uh, the ornaments uh, the utensils of cooking and the methods of cooking all these things uh, uh, done not with a private profit motive. A private wealth idea uh, has not yet entered. Then you get a second period of agriculture when the production for the sake of uh, creating uh, wealth that is uh, 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 more, more than needed uh, was uh, uh, possible. And with that, there is a, a social organization begins gradually to end. These are all gradual changes, not one day, one night, and then next night something uh, changed. Gradual changes, which would have taken long times, when there was emergence of uh, people with uh, larger land holdings. With that comes, with the la larger land holding also comes the uh, creation of the poor. People who had lesser land or no lands. Now this was the uh, uh, second stage, what we, we can call agricultural stage, two phases. 
Now then, we are coming to the third phase, which from my point of view, uh, in terms of uh, 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 understanding the modern times, the more, most important stage, that is from around uh, 8th uh, century uh, AD till the time of the, uh, in the, in the, till the end of 19th century, almost, long period, where the principle of social organization was the caste system. We will explain that, and uh, we are not worried about various things about the caste. What we are uh, uh, important is, as foundational principles of society, whether the principles of that society and the uh, principles that we spoke as the foundational principles of human rights, whether they uh, collide and how they collide and how to some extent this has been gradually getting uh, resolved and where it has stopped. The uh, fourth stage uh, is uh, arrival of the, uh, in the coastal areas, the Western uh, colonization, particularly the period from 1815 to 1948, the British period, which saw some very uh, dramatic uh, 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 changes. And finally, we come to the period after independence, and that also could be divided into two periods. There's the period from 1948 to about 1970, and from about 1970 up to uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, changes in foundational principles, uh, on the basis of constitutional uh, uh, changes and other changes. Now, I think the most important thing to begin for any culture is the original times, the beginning of uh, uh, that culture. And in Sri Lanka, now the prehistorian tell us that the first part is a very long period. They say comfortably, it is at least uh, 60,000 years old, 60,000. Now the period of history that we talk about mostly is about 2,500. But where yeah, the uh, settled uh, people uh, 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 of the indigenous people who have got themselves settled in Sri Lanka has at least 60,000 years of history. Uh, the evidence is uh, at the, the beginnings is much longer period. The first finding on the Balangoda man is on uh, 125,000 years old. Globally, Homo sapiens, that is the human beings like us, uh, brain capacity is more or less the same. Physical capacity is uh, uh, same, uh, 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 like we are now. This uh, uh, emergence of Homo uh, sapiens, they say, is about 150,000 years uh, old, around that time. Of course, these things cannot be said exactly uh, 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 this year, uh, you know, the date and the year and the month, you cannot say. But broadly speaking, is about 150 years. On this, the world uh, 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 expert opinion agrees. So on, on that, there is agreement. So what is the? Uh, 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 it is when you look at these foundational principles of human rights from the point of view of that early human beings uh, who lived. Uh, uh, in other parts of the world also at different times. But we will confine ourselves to people who lived in Sri Lanka. Were those principles present? Without any doubt, we can say those principles were present for two reasons. Because between the period, between this period of uh, 60,000 years 
at least till about 5000 or uh, uh, 5000 years before now or 6000 years there's an agricultural age they lived together it was a collective living of course each one look after their food uh, but there there was no idea of private property and private property concept makes a huge difference to civilization now this large part of uh, uh, larger than we can imagine uh, part of our history there was no idea of private property private property means certain part of the property i uh, one person acquires and then for the perpetuity it belongs to them and they can do whatever they like in, in that the, now that concept did not exist that doesn't mean people did not consume uh, certain things on their own people ate their food everybody's uh, you know uh, 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 they would have had some place to sleep uh, for some place for their family to be around but none of these had the idea of private property now this is not just a uh, uh, sri lankan phenomenon it is something that is uh, valid for the whole world that uh, the pre agricultural age man, uh, human beings did not have the uh, uh, concept of for the social arrangements on the basis of private property. There was a, a, a sharing of resources and there was a cooperation between them. And for us in particular in Sri Lanka, we were not even divided into tribes. Now in certain countries like African country, uh, certain areas, uh, they uh, they are indigenous people, there is no private property concept, but uh, there are uh, certain properties belong to a particular tribe. And any other tribe is forbidden from trespassing into the territory of another tribe. To that extent, there was a separation of uh, uh, property, property of one tribe as against the property of uh, uh, other others. Sri Lanka, we don't have this uh, uh, problem. Uh, we, we didn't have a, a tribal society, so therefore there was no tribal warfare. So virtually, uh, we have a period, a very long period of cooperation. See the foundational principles of human rights that I earlier mentioned are developed in modern times around one concept that is the concept of cooperation how do people uh, you know come to cooperate with each other for their common living after the agricultural age and the later ages into trade commerce thereafter you know uh, production by industry these things come lots of conflicts and then the modern uh, uh, idea of human rights is based on in the midst of these conflicts how do we work out uh, uh, area of cooperation where everybody's interest is looked into but this original period we don't have that problem there was no private property so what you have to understand is what is the importance from that in terms of culture culture means those internalized habits people develop for a long period of time which are embedded into their mind in the, into their psyche into their unconscious also into their social behavior so we have a, such a long period of impact uh, or, or, or which lives on see uh, 
uh, culture, the, the essential element of a culture is it takes a long time to form cultural habits. But once they are deep enough to be formed, then they have a permanent impact. It goes on. So long as those people uh, remain, they go on, and if they go somewhere else, they carry those things to our other societies. And then there are interactions between people of different cultures, and in that they influence each other. There is no time where uh, one culture can completely dominate and erase another culture. Because these are habits of which, which we are not under control. Cultural habits, in the deeper sense, are those habits about which we really don't have a very uh, a deep control. They are, in fact, born with us, and they are transmitted by us, whether we like it or not. And even if we externally change in many ways, internally, these habits uh, uh, remain. Of course, they get modified. As time goes on, there are certain modifications externally. Uh, people who uh, lived at a time when there was no proper roadways, no transport of the type we have now, uh, 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 are changed to some extent when these things are introduced. But they are not made anew. This is the important thing. There is nothing called uh, uh, human beings that could be created as a complete new human beings. We carry our culture with us. So in Sri Lanka, we can definitely say that over a six, at least 60,000 years, we did have the idea of human dignity. Nobody was thought as superior to the other. Human dignity begins with that. There can be functional superiority, which is developed at later times. The modern society has a lot of functional superiors. But functional superiority is different to natural dignity, natural equality. So we all share a natural equality. And in our culture, this is something that was very, very deeply embedded. It was not based on an idea of any religion or any philosophies. They were based on living and understanding of life as we born and which have become collective. Collective understanding, giving rise to collective perceptions. This is how we should do under these circumstances, collective forms of actions and collective forms of support to each other, uh, uh, we instinctively feel, now this is something has happened, which should not happen. We instinctively go into uh, 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 helping a person. Now you may think that is these are not very important things to think about. But in terms of modern times and the understandings we have, these are very important things. For example, when people live together for a long time and have a respect for the dignity of each other, with that develops an idea of certain compassion. It's a collective idea. It's not that I have compassion to other, the other and the other doesn't have uh, towards me. Naturally, there is, of course, there are aberrations, there are some people due to various reasons who are not under control, but otherwise there is a basic uh, compassion. Now you see in the 20th century, particularly in, uh, at the end of 19th century to 20th century, there was philosophies that grew up which says sympathy is a bad thing. Compassion is a bad thing. Compassion uh, 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 is an obstacle to development. The people uh, who wants to, uh, uh, you know, to do great things should be supermen. 
superman means they must be ready to do the cruel cruelty if cruelty is needed for their uh, uh, betterment so cruelty become uh, uh, not a evil but a virtue i will not go very uh, deep into this at this stage later maybe we got it just to introduce to you that uh, uh, this attitudes of that deep attitudes which are formed over a long period of time is a vital part of our behavior and in that vital part in our cultural origins we do have the idea of human dignity very deeply embedded and uh, the the two things had not yet emerged which creates uh, unfortunately necessarily emerge later but which creates also problems that is private property in the state original uh, our original people for uh, over nearly 60000 years had no state so when we talk about a uh, right protection of rights in uh, these times they are not uh, uh, the in the modern sense of protection being given by uh, the the uh, uh, a state there was no need for that and that was state has not yet been created it means the individual people cooperating with each other so the human dignity was firmly rooted in that what is the the basically what does human dignity means human dignity means in terms of our understanding of homo sapiens that human beings is different to others in their capacity for consciousness the most highly developed form of consciousness is with the homo sapiens that is why they become homo sapiens physical characteristics have emerged over a long uh, a period and we can trace back and show these physical characteristic how they have evolved but consciousness that is uh, became a part of the uh, you know a human person is something that even today with the greatest uh, amount of uh, 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 you know research and work of uh, great experts cannot uh, cannot be explained you know there is neuroscience now there is psychology all these have come to some understandings but the uh, what the the human consciousness consists of uh, and Uh, uh, these matters are yet to be solved but we know one thing that human consciousness is such a comprehensive and powerful endowment of the homo sapiens it could be divided broadly into three areas that is the cognitive capacity cognitive capacity means your ability to reason your ability to make deductions and in the modern times to make observations and develop scientific uh, 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 theories uh, the, the way are what we do with our minds and the logic there is a long history and that is one part of our mind one time they thought this is the only part of the mind cognitive capacity is the only capacity but today thanks to a lot of research uh into various fields including particularly the the uh, psychology we you know that human beings have another uh, uh, areas of the consciousness uh, which are emotional not just uh, only rational cognitive part is a rational part but we have emotional uh also aesthetic the capacity to enjoy a thing you know to appreciate a thing uh to uh, uh you know to have a 
certain enjoyment of a, a, a beauty or, or things like that. And also uh, feelings, deeper feelings, feelings of compassion, feelings of also both ways, feelings of hate, feelings of love, feelings of, uh, you know, alienation. We, we have a, a larger, very large area of our mind is occupied with the emotional. Today we are also further understanding consciousness. And now we know that there's a third element, which is called the spiritual. Every human being is endowed with capacity for the spiritual. How the spiritual is defined depends on different cultures and different uh, philosophies. But what everyone agrees is there is an area that we call the deepest part of human experience is uh, 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 spiritual. One of the first uh, uh, people to discover this in the world was the Indian yogis. What the Indian yogis have uh, developed at, the, at this time, according to a famous, uh, you know, the uh, writer and uh, highly reputed uh, the, uh, uh, philosopher, Aldous Huxley, his book, The Brave New World, he says, that if someday people discover what the, um, uh, what the, uh, old uh, yogis did, it will be an enormous discovery, uh, unparalleled discovery in science. So, uh, all these endowments are natural to everybody. That is what the human dignity means. It doesn't depend on any kind of uh, wealth, status, uh, anything like that. Uh, is simply by being a homo sapiens, all these things are part of us. If some people don't respect this, it's too bad for them. It's simply beyond dispute that we all have these characteristics. Recognizing that in every, uh, every way is what, what you mean by a human dignity. Whether it is for uh, anybody who is in a higher position, or uh, average uh, citizen, or those who are disabled, those who cannot uh, function fully as a uh, with the healthy uh, characteristic of a Homo sapiens, all of them share this in common. This is the foundation of understanding of Homo sapiens. That is also the foundation of understanding of human rights. So human dignity is universal in that sense. There cannot be a human being who do not have dignity, whether even if he is the worst war criminal, still, even at that point, their dignity cannot be fully taken away. Sometimes it is a necessity to punish uh, people who do wrong things. But even in doing that, the factor that is taken into consideration is that this is a human being. Even at that point, we cannot treat that person same as we deal with a thing. Uh, because they possess this human consciousness with all these characteristics. So that is the first uh, foundational principle. The second foundation of principles is equality. Equality arises from that same uh, consideration. That being homo sapiens, they are equal to uh, each other. But unlike the issue of uh, 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 human dignity, equality becomes problematic from the time the private property emerges and the state uh, emerge. You will find much of the discussions on the political science in the uh, uh, modern, what is called the modern period, that's about last 400, 400 years 
in uh, European context uh, were discussions about governance and uh, which simply meant how to deal with the uh, inequalities because the modes of production has created inequalities. Now, how to bet best manage this without, uh, you know, leaving anybody completely out? That is a, a, a huge debate. But the foundation of, uh, of equality is not the property uh, uh, issue, but the fact of they being homo, homo sapiens. So uh, uh, a conflict has to be resolved between what human beings are by nature and human beings are by social uh, uh, development. Now that is the area we will uh, uh, discuss uh, in more uh, detail because much of the problems of our time are around the issue of uh, equality. But the foundation principle is based on the grounds that I mentioned earlier. Third, and the most, uh, perhaps the overwhelmingly important aspects in modern time and modern controversies is the idea of liberty. Now, again, when you go back to the original position, that's the position of the original people of Sri Lanka, they had they, 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 they had liberty to do whatever they, they wish, so long as they did not harm others, and so they, uh, long as they did not harm nature. So the very idea of liberty was very much linked to the idea of preservation of nature, because nature was the ground of their being. The nature get destroyed, they knew they will get destroyed. They will suffer uh, serious problems if they uh, get uh, 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 the, uh, 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 they destroy nature. They, as you know, in the global debate, the issue of nature, uh, you know, has come to the forefront because the global warming, climate change environmental uh, 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 changes, the use of uh, uh, fuel that uh, damages uh, the environment, all these things have become major problems for civilization. Whether we can survive itself is today being very seriously uh, 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 a question. But for the original man, these were not problems at all. They always thought of themselves not only as human beings by separately, but they thought of themselves as human beings living with nature. It means the nature in every way, not only the rivers and the seas and the, the sky and the rain and things like that, but also the animals and the trees and things like that. All those things a part of a one whole. The idea that everything is a part of a whole is of course today well explained in terms of later scientific uh, uh, discoveries. But the original people lived, although they didn't have theories over that, they lived on, on that uh, 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 basis. The question of the fourth element, that is question of justice, did not arise in the way that they arise now. Because the conflicts were less. The, and these, these conflicts were resolved by, you know, uh, uh, in these uh, original people also throughout their time, had their own what is called the promoker, promoker or uh, leaders not the leaders in the sense of what we have later as kings and things like that, but uh, informally uh, people who turn to somebody and may either because he's uh, more mature or older 
in order to help with the uh, uh, settling certain uh, uh, dispute. So there was the dispute settlement was more the work of wisdom. The question of law has not yet come. The law was not necessary for that society. There were certain informal understandings which make, we may call the kind of uh, uh, the, the traditional law. But they are not even traditional law in that sense, what we call the customary law or anything. They didn't think in terms of law at all. It was more what is called the sirita, habit. The way of dealing things with each other. There was a certain firmness in that, that those traditions should not be broken because it will lead to some damage. On the other hand, they were not rigidly, uh, rigid rules imposed from above. The idea of the law is that law ultimately is imposed from above. There was no such concept in that uh, society. So the justice uh, problem is, uh, we find, becoming a very problematic problem in terms of Sri Lanka because its evolution is uh, quite uh, uh, recent and uh, uh, beset with a lot of conflicts which came around. Uh, now, the idea of this is that uh, not to go on and on because uh, uh, you may find it uh, uh, difficult to follow that if you uh, need to raise any questions, uh, I will stop from time to time in order to give you a chance to uh, raise any questions so that it could be clarified further. So, uh, at this stage, do you have any, anything that you want to be clarified further? what we discuss. Okay, there is one uh, request uh, to explain the idea of uh, equality. Uh, the, uh, there is, uh, there are two uh, ways of explaining uh, equality. One is the natural form of equality, which is what we talk about in terms of the original people. That is, in sharing of resources, everybody has an equal right. Now that was an original position which was possible in the uh, 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 that society which uh, before the uh, private property came in. Anybody can pick up from any tree uh, whatever fruit they want. Suppose you know, there are lots of beautiful stories about how the indigenous people, not only in Sri Lanka but throughout the world, they had uh, 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 this, uh, this had this idea of that they have a right to the fruits of the earth. Example: One uh, indigenous uh, story from Philippines is that uh, when the missionaries came. Later, the, uh, they were walking towards with the group of uh, indigenous people to the areas there where they, where they were living, to the mountains. So when the indigenous people were going and they found uh, uh, things, uh, fruits like guava, uh, you know, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, when it is ripe, it is a good fruit to quench your thirst. So they will, when they pick up a uh, 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 fruit, they just uh, pick up one. That is enough for uh, uh, them on the way. If they need again, they will pick up something else later. But when the missionaries show these things, they started taking a bag and, uh, you know, started putting lots of uh, these uh, freely available fruits. Uh, the uh, because the missionaries came from the West and they were so used to the idea of private property, and they just uh, saw something and they privatized it immediately. 
and the indigenous uh, people knew these things are there in the forest and uh, they could take it whenever uh, they want and this is you know a universal uh, story and if you uh, uh, into buddhist uh, sutras you find in uh, one instance uh, uh, lord buddha tried to explain how the conflicts came in the world Uh, uh, he said, "You know, th those olden times, people used to go to the forest uh, every day and pick up whatever they needed—grains or fruit or whatever—and they came back and they used it for the day. The next day, they will again go to the uh, forest and pick up what they needed for the next day, and it goes on like that." So, uh, uh, if a one person is going to the forest, he will call his neighbors. So, a few neighbors will go together. One day, the one one person called his neighbor and said, "Come, let us go and pick up something as we do usually." The uh, other man said, "No, you see, I don't need to go today." <clears throat> so why? Well. You know, I picked up enough for a few days. So, the old—it was not the old habit of just picking up for the day. Has collected enough for a few days. So the next man thinks, well, I don't have to go every day. Also, if I also do this, so he also uh, pick up for some more days. And then the habit is formed that everybody picks up more than what they need. For the, for the day, nature doesn't have a time enough to reproduce what they will take from nature. So with that, you know, uh, he says uh, uh, th th this is where all the conflicts uh, uh, began. The equal equality of uh, 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 sharing the resources came to a problem with. The acquisitive instincts, which would have come for uh, legitimate uh, reasons, but that is how the conflict came. So, equality in earlier times, equality in our times, are, are different because of this, because of means of production. First of all, the agricultural production made it possible to have uh, what is called a surplus. There are stories in the in the ancient Singhala uh, uh, literature where uh, one um, uh, uh, person will go to another person, borrow rice because the other person has an uh, excess of more than what they need, and another person does not have, uh, so they they will borrow. Now, if you go into uh, uh, more recent times, uh, uh, the book like uh, the uh, village in the jungle, the uh, uh, now which is also a, a, a film that they come, you will find how uh, uh, these develop uh, uh, gradually. Say a rich uh, 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 landowner is there. And then there is the rich merchant, who is there also mostly from a nearby little urbanized area. And there is this uh, uh, farmer who doesn't have land, and who also doesn't have money in order to buy uh, things necessary for cultivation, like seeds. Now, uh, at the beginning of cultivation. He goes to the the man who has a lot of land and tells that person, "Please uh, uh, give me some plot of land from your land, and I will pay you for that when, when the harvest comes. I'll give you your share when the harvest comes." And then uh, now he needs uh, seeds and other things, uh, maybe fertilizer. 
then he goes to the merchant and the merchant also very gladly give him the what is needed and now he has to pay back once again uh, when the harvest comes so one day this young farmer who gets involved in this and then he finds he is left with nothing next time when he wants to uh, uh, farm he has to do the same thing so one day he complains to the merchant who comes there see now you take everything both of you take everything now he said don't worry uh, the merchant says don't worry because i will again give you a, a, a loan in other words by giving the loans and rent it in land they take everything what the uh, farmer produced now this this problem gave rise to the modern notions of uh, uh, equality that is trying to set limits to what can be taken it becomes almost impossible to have uh, to go back to the original situation because of the very nature of production agriculture cannot be done in the same way as the uh, you know uh, uh, the hunting the gatherers they have a life and now you have to farm this is this was different production and different possibilities with that came a uh, complex question had uh, was how to develop ways by which the complex are controlled to an extent that the basic interest of also the people who are at the bottom of the ladder are also protected secondly conflicting interests of people who are at the top of the ladder is also controlled see when uh, if uh, there are two landlords if one is uh, physically more strong and he has more goon squad and things like that he can take over the other other man's land also so there was there was a need to put limits to competition the yeah, the working out limits to competition on the one hand the competition was necessary because given those resources people will not work unless uh, they get a profit out of it but if they try to take the whole of the profit the people will go starving they cannot uh, uh, survive so there had to be uh, uh, rules work out sometimes by traditional way later by law in order to ensure that certain basic things are guaranteed to all so equality fundamentally in terms of this context means that there is a basic guarantee of uh, uh, what is needed for life guaranteed to all and meanwhile the competition uh, is controlled in a way that uh, the uh, you uh, one particular person or a group cannot take over the whole now that is where the political science developments were you know uh, thomas hobbes in europe his theory was that how the state comes into being uh, we told uh, we told earlier that original people didn't even have a state but they don't need one but then the the later state became necessity why because there were conflicting interest and everyone will you know uh, come to a point of killing each other destroying each other Uh, uh, all this 
in order to <coughs> improve their wealth. So there had to be some uh, authority. <coughs> Uh, and the authority that was created was called the state. So one of the fundamental tasks of the state is to maintain a certain balance between the conflicting interest. And so the equality does not mean complete equality in terms of uh, 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 resources in the modern times, because that is uh, simply not possible. A more developed uh, system is where larger share is given to uh, 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 the share of the people is also larger. Now, that is what we began to call social democracy. Instead of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, total uh, controls, there is a social democracy that is that is how the idea of uh, right to health uh, for everybody, so that the state will have uh, uh, will have to build hospitals, education. State will have to provide uh, schools and teachers and things like that. Uh, various amenities, water uh, management, light, uh, electricity, and all this. All these aspects, uh, uh, you know, to be guaranteed by the state came because the natural equality it was no longer. Uh, possible. So the the uh, the state will uh, is supposed to be uh, equalizer, not a complete equalizer, but uh, uh, improving shares, beginning with the people at the bottom and preventing. Uh, uh, undue exploitation by uh, 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 others. For example, the business world, you know, there's a whole business law. Uh, what is called unfair practices in trade. Say, let us say somebody start a business and he has certain secret in that business. And somebody else who is working there sells this secret to another person for a profit or whatever. That's an offense. That's a crime. Because uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the in order to uh, limit uh, to how much you can exploit. So modern concept of uh, uh, equality is around the issue of how uh, large shares uh, are shared between people. It doesn't mean complete equality because virtually complete equality means under the present circumstances. We don't know in the future in a different kind of a social setting. It, it may be possible, but in the present circumstances, on the one hand, you have to keep the production going. And the production does not go on unless there is a profit motive. On the other hand, the people who live, who work, and who are really the ultimate producers of wealth should have uh, their share. How to work out various forms of laws, various forms of practices, uh, practices, various forms of mentalities in order to ensure uh, that there is this kind of distribution. That is what is called equality. This only not only in the production level, but also in the uh, uh, punishment uh, 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 and the law, the crime. Now, uh, if a crime is committed, the state has uh, gained for itself the right to punish that, and that is, uh, you know, called the criminal law. But the person who goes to court also has to be treated like any other person who comes in the same situation. A one murderer cannot be treated in a different way than another murderer. 
the, the, so the law of punishments and uh, adjudication has to be completely equal. That is why, that is where the complete equality is expected. That is called the, the equality before law. Equality before law and the equality before the economic production is not the same. But the equality before law means when a person goes before the law to settle a dispute, each party should be treated in the same way, same rules should apply, same methods of dealing with it uh, should happen. That is equality uh, before law. Now, uh, you know, philosophically, a question came. Uh, 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 people can, uh, you know, people with the more uh, socialist, uh, social consciousness, they say, why should there be any difference at all? <coughs> well, the reply to that that was uh, 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 developed philosophically was, well, we don't know any other better principle than equality of dealing with resources. It, it has a lot of imperfections. The imperfections can add also lead to uh, tremendous social upheavals. And the upheavals have not really settled the question of inequality. Once again, they create uh, their system of inequality. So, so long as there is a time when the productive, productive system no longer requires, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, private ownership as it is now. And that is hardly uh, uh, possible for us to imagine what that situation is because in trying to imagine many other problems have been created in the world. 20th century is an indication where the people try to solve the equality problem and uh, engage in the kind of uh, revolutions which brought more suffering, particularly for the very people that they want to serve, that's the poor. Uh, so we simply don't have an absolute solution to the problem of equality to be same for everybody. But equal, what the equality means is what I explained to you uh, uh, earlier, working out certain rules within which certain things cannot be deprived from the uh, 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 people, from everybody, anybody. I hope that will to some extent satisfy you, but there's a huge amount of literature on that. But this is just to guide the, uh, the idea. When we come to uh, economic, social, cultural rights, we can discuss in more detail. And when we come to the civil and political rights, we can develop it in, uh, discuss it in a different way. The idea of equality in both uh, have similarities as well as differences. Uh, if, you are, if you have no other uh, issue, we will now begin to proceed uh, to the uh, uh, next uh, uh, stage. Uh, so we, we have said what are the uh, uh, basic foundational principles of foundational principles of uh, human rights. Uh, now uh, Let's go into more uh, details uh, in terms of the um, uh, civil and uh, political rights uh, issues. And later, we will come to economic and uh, social and cultural uh, rights. Now, uh, the question of uh, in the uh, today, and as it has always been, the most important principle is right to life. Now, 
in coming to uh, discuss discuss that we should also go back uh, to we discuss the first early stage of uh, uh, original people then we have to uh, discuss also the other four stages the development of agriculture which we discussed already where it was made possible to have surplus gradually the sur surplus was shared at the beginning collectively later the development of uh, land ownership and uh, more powerful people acquiring greater portions of land and uh, which is creating on the other hand people uh, uh, who earlier had some land losing their land for one person to have more land since the land area is limited it has to be taken from somebody else so with that you get a whole group of people who either have to uh, become laborers in their own lands or have some kinds of contracts with the landlord uh, on the basis of sharing the produce now we have this systems called andagovias uh uh you know they will work on the land that is belongs to somebody else and uh give a certain uh, portion of their produce to the landlord who does not work uh, on the land he, do he doesn't get engaged in production but because of the ownership of land he gets a share so you get that kind of contracts uh, understandings it's like a, a you know like renting land but there is another uh, uh, group which are entirely daily laborers they come they work in somebody the landlord's land on the instructions given by the landlord or his representative and they may get various uh, uh, kind of reward adequate or not adequate depending on circumstances where the uh, uh, you know are dependent entirely on uh, their for livelihood on the land but they have no control of Uh, not only the land but also even the produce and things like that now this can happen only by use of violence when you have serious conflicts relating to land when the uh, people do not voluntarily submit themselves that arrangement so they will try by various ways to get get a greater share of that uh, uh, than what is given to them so in that process and lord in order to maintain their uh, interest has to turn to violence this happens in every kind of production the uh, 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 later times of uh, production as against the original time is where violence become a certain part of society what is permissible levels of violence has been the debate settled in different countries in a different ways but basically that there is a certain uh use of violence uh and sometimes extreme forms of uh, uh violence is a part of this new arrangements 
high in the agriculture or later on the industrialization. The when the the issue of violence come the, uh, uh, is one of the areas that need to be understanding very thoroughly to understand human rights early periods of interaction of violence gradually develops into the use of terror frighten the people so that they will accept the rules They, the, the, it is not possible to accept certain unjust rules by reasoning alone. It has to be forced on the people. So this force forcing is done through use of uh, uh, violence. So there is, uh, you know, one of the first uh, crimes that develop. It's the crime against theft. You may think the first crime would have been uh, regarding taking of life. But in fact, earliest forms of criminal development is relating to various forms of theft. De Define in the new way. What earlier the people picked up from the jungle was no theft. It was taken from uh, nature, and people thought that they are entitled to take it. But now, it is not the nature who owns the natural resource, but it is an, uh, uh, individuals or groups that owns the natural resource. So if you take something that belongs to a different owner, then you are stealing. So this idea of stealing and theft has to be imposed by punishment. Uh, a person who takes something from uh, another person's property can be severely beaten up or even you know, uh, uh, killed with the idea of terrorizing. You know, this idea of terrorizing is something that has to be understood to understand human rights. Society develops an instrument to control, uh, a uh, to, have, to have the rules under uh, uh, rules enforced. The rules are made by, not by consent, but by people who can make those rules. And then you have to terrorize people to accept those rules. Terrorizing simply means that it is punishment is not directed towards an individual. Every punishment is a message to the rest of society. It may be that time the rest of society meant a village. Each village was a, some kind of a self-contained unit. So, if you punish somebody in the village, the message goes to the rest of the villages that if you do that kind of thing, you will get the same treatment. And this will be inculcated to the young, from the yeah, very early years. Don't do that because if you do that, you will get into very serious uh, uh, problems. And you will be treated with violence. Gradually, this whole idea develops into a much bigger scales and things like that, which we can discuss as we go along. The this, as as I told you earlier, in the habit formation, it is not only the good habits that become part of our psyche. In our mind. The pain that is caused to us also become part of our psyche and our mind. So terrorizing has a social function. 
the social function is to develop certain fears. Fear is also a, a very strong emotion. Develop certain fears in a way that to instinctively feel I should not do it. Like a child learning that if you put your finger to fire, you get burned. So they will learn not to do that. Same way societally, they will see that certain practices, if I if I don't go to work, I could be punished. Uh, they can just dismiss me and take somebody else, then I, I will starve. Or worse, if they really want to force me, they will bring me, then they will punish me in a way that, you know, that I, 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 I can be prevented even from uh, leaving the uh, uh, property. All these things about Dandukanda and all these things are not myth, mythical things, they are real things. So we have to understand uh, in the development of our culture, this element of uh, terrorizing. Uh, so, uh, 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 terrorizing, uh, dealing with the problem of terrorizing, developing opposing principles to terrorizing has been one of the major tasks of the human rights field throughout the world for centuries. Every culture had this terrorizing function. The terrorizing function uh, uh, created the slave even in an advanced culture like uh, Greece, uh, all the rights belong only to the citizen. There were lots of slaves. Slaves had no rights. Slaves were, by their very definition, were treated as things, not persons. And therefore, they lived at the mercy of the, the their owners. They were owned, like the land is owned, cattle is uh, uh, owned, trees can be owned, like that. Those human beings who are called slaves were also owned by somebody else. They had no will of their own. They had to submit themselves to the will of another. Now this by, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 by consent. You have to impose heavy forms of punishment in order to create a message. This is the way things are done here. The insight into this, in terms of the American experience of slaves, I recommend you read the work of Edric Douglas, very uh, popular uh, 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 reader, uh, writer of the 18th, uh, 19th centuries, uh, a slave, originally a slave, <coughs> uh, who fled from slavery uh, and later be joined the, what, what, they, what was called the, uh, you know, uh, the people who fought for the emancipation of uh, the slaves uh, and became a very prominent uh, person in espousing that cause. He wrote extensively explaining how slavery is maintained. For example, uh, a slave does not know who his father is. Sometimes, in many cases, slave women were used by the slave owner himself and produce children to be slaves. So the identity of the father will never be uh, disclosed and also 
uh, other than the sexual function of producing a child, he will have no other relationship to the child. This was adopted as a means of ensuring you don't have to buy a slave. You know, earlier, you had to buy a slave in the market. Now you don't have to buy. And they will be controlled from the beginning. Uh, 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 affection of the uh, uh, father and mother will be deprived to them. Mother, by the time the child is able to, you know, maybe first few months, you can survive would be given to others and the mother will be sold as a slave somewhere else. That is the end of their relationship. So you create people without any kind of human relationship to ensure that they will remain slaves. Like that, that's the extreme example. The same way that we do to elephants who are used for domestic purposes. When an elephant is caught, in the wild, and then uh, it has to be tame in a way human beings can use his uh, uh, services. First thing that is done is for months they are deprived of you know, food, they are put in chains, and they are given various ways of pain, picking uh, and you know, picking and, and various things. To an extent that that mighty mighty uh, you know animal begin to show shudder uh, that uh, the will obey. So creating obedience in that sense has been work of terror. A question has been asked in terms of uh, modern nation state. Uh, include the violence in, uh, inherent in the nation state. See, uh, uh, nation state is what I earlier tried to explain to you in terms of Thomas Hobbes, where a state, the way the state is created. Uh, Authority is uh, uh, agreed upon, that's what's called the social contract theory. And they, they are given the power to make law and to enforce law. And in a totalitarian state, this means the control of people by uh, violence. So this is why it is said, the state has, is the sole repository of use of violence. The, in a modern nation state, nobody uh, has the right to use violence, but the state has. That is why the police officers get the right to arrest. Uh, the uh, jails are there, nobody goes to jail freely. People are put there by force. So in the nation state, violence is exercised in the framework of laws, written laws. Whether the laws are liberal or laws are more uh, rigorous depends on the nature of the state. In a totalitarian state, the rules and the enforcement is very rigorous. And on the other hand, in the more liberal state, they are liberalized in a way to minimize the use of uh, violence. The term use is not use of violence, but the term use is called the use of Coercion, doing things by force, coerce somebody. Now, none of us have the right to coerce anybody to do anything. Uh, it has to be by way of among adults, 
it has to be by way of consent whether it be personal relationships or uh, ownership problems uh, uh, everything is governed by the idea that both parties come to some form of agreement but coercion means you are forced to do something the state nation state has the power to coerce that is to use violence in order to force you to do something for example if a man is to be hung nobody is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, will agree to be hung but the state will deprive him all the possibility and use this, their guards and everybody and possibly go and hang him he has no alternative no family can intervene to help or anything like that so the in the nation state also the principle of violence exist but the difference is that over the civilizations uh, uh, development we have uh, tried to develop ways to minimize the idea of terror punishment which does not amount to uh, terror is worked on one principle and that principle is only individuals can be punished you cannot punish uh, 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 simply for the purpose of teaching a lesson because when an individual is punished or teaching a lesson to others but it is mediated through a legal process ensure that particular person has in fact done the crime that he is he is to be punished for now there are systems which does not require this don't don't, uh, don't take it for granted because we have got used to this that in every system it is need to prove individual uh, uh, criminal liability punishment in principle itself certain societies have the idea that we don't punish individuals whether he is guilty or not doesn't matter we make example of individuals choose any anybody and we punish them so that others will learn a lesson a good example for that is the imposed disappearance you know that many people who were subjected to enforced disappearances has in fact nothing to do with any form of very serious uh, uh, engagement in terrorist activities or many of them not any kind of uh, involvement in uh, surveys uh, parents have been interviewed clearly shows that if there's a clever child from a poor family and is doing well in the exam school exams and then there is a richer man mudalali or somebody who has children and they are not doing well in the exam they can write a petition during that time you know, when this enforced disappearances were there so somebody who is involved in that kind of work the boy will be taken and he will never return his guilt has never been proved so punishment without proof of guilt is terrorizing but we have experience in many kind of punishments particularly uh, in the recent period from about, from about 1978 are uh, not a punishment from the point of view of law legitimate punishments but they are you know punishment for the purpose of terrorizing so nation state has also that function but the development of the nation state the attempt is to minimize the level of coercion as much as uh, possible and to leave uh, matters for reason and for consent 
So the definition of democracy essentially is the least form of coercion. Least form of coercion means minimum level of use of force. So that is why methods are developed for rehabilitation of prisoners rather than keeping them in uh, jail for a long time. The methods in order to uh, mitigate sentences and uh, uh, allow people to leave earlier from their punishments, legitimate punishments, even if their behavior is, uh, had been good and they saw signs of reform. But above all, minimize the number of people who goes to jail, instead find other means of, uh, you know, getting the people back into the community. All these are notions which have been developed in order to civilize the idea of, if you can use the word civilize, idea of coercion, minimize coercion. That's the nature of a democratic state. You can judge a democratic state by that yardstick. Are the methods they deal uh, to deal with people more rational and uh, consent based, or is it by terrorizing? More terrorizing there is, it means there is more uh, uh, of authoritarian, uh, authoritarian uh, uh, methods. I hope that answers that question. Uh, if you need, uh, later, we can go into the development of the nation state and uh, associated uh, 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 problems. But at the moment, I'm trying to introduce to you this uh, evolution in, in Sri Lanka. At this stage, when we are talking, nation state has not come into being. That's the early stage of agriculture and the second stage of agriculture. Still, the na nation state has not come into being. Nation state, as we call it now, is a very modern concept. But with the emergence of kings, then there is a state authority comes into being for the first time, but in a very underdeveloped way. <clears throat> state is not something that people made in one day. It is made over centuries. The emergence of our kings is the first stage where an authority is created by all other authorities who has the power to make law and to impose law. The early kings, according to prehistorians, were also from the same uh, uh, earlier original people. The idea that somebody came from India and uh, he's from uh, some princely uh, uh, family and thereafter he uh, created the Sri Lanka. He's, uh, you know, uh, at best as a myth. That is some story which says something, but it is not historical, uh, historically uh, anything taken seriously. <clears throat> okay. So the uh the, the at this stage you still do not have uh, uh nation state as such but certain authorities created and the first people the kings uh, uh, were more benevolent that is why up to the anuradhapura period is considered the best uh, uh, a period in uh, Sri Lankan history in terms of irrigation development and in terms of development of art such as sculpture uh, and uh, the uh, 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 things like the, uh, art products other than literature. According to Martin Vikram Singh, the, the, uh, in, a, in a book, uh, you know, where there is a collected works of Martin Vikram Singh in English, he says, 
that there were three uh, achievements of the uh, early uh, Sri Lankans and the, all of that belongs to the Nuradhapura uh, period. From around the 8th century uh, AD up to the time of the British is characterized as a period of degeneration in Sri Lanka, a period which is called Parihani. Uh, uh, not a development, but the opposite of that. Things went down. And uh, uh, during this period, we come to the third, uh, fourth element we are talking about in the historical development. An institution came into Sri Lanka which, is, which, which organized the entire society. And that was the caste system. It is very essential to understand caste from a sociological point of view. We are not interested in, you know, these marriages and all that, that, that kind of, uh, uh, this is not the, uh, our interest here. From a human rights point of view, we are interested in that as from a social development point of view. Caste development means uh, uh, social organization in terms of caste is based on two principles. One is that of complete absence of social mobility. That every person should do their parents' job. Every male should do the father's job. And nobody can deviate from that. It was a worse crime. Worst crime was somebody to step outside. Whether it, uh, uh, whichever the group, you know, whether it's the richer people or the poor people, everybody had only so social mobility is very important in understanding modern societies. It's absent for this whole period, over thousand years. Early period has social mobility, rather for a period, period just prior to that, there is social mobility, there were no prohibitions to people uh, on what they want to do. But with this came uh, uh, prohibition, punishable serious by serious punishment that you cannot change your social position. Second principle is unequal or uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, punishments, uh, which are uh, extraordinary forms of punishments. The excessive uh, 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 punishments, depending on status, a poor or the low caste or what is called, was called the Kulahina. If they do an offense, say for example, steal from the land of a rich man or do some harm to a rich man, assault or kill, he can be punished with death and also his entire family and his clan. These are very fundamental principles to understand. Punishment now we are used to this idea of individual being punished. It was not what existed in Sri Lanka over a thousand years. What existed was if a lower uh, group, for example, a male of some caste wear an upper gown for, to cover the upper part of the body, it could be punished severely for that. That was a rule that they did not do it for. You know, not wearing upper government was not done because of convenience or because it's a heat, things like that. They were done because they were, that, that was a rule. If you do that, you'll be punished. Uh, if you talk to uh, somebody who's called higher, your posture of sitting uh, or standing, your way of talking and bowing, 
had to be uh, 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 very uh, uh, reverential. And uh, it went into deep into the language itself. The person from upper caste is, uh, you know, talked to with the terms of reverence. Pahanse and uh, and all that kind of uh, things. And uh, people of the lower caste with terms like Po, Pu, Mu, all these were uh, came into the language. So we have a very deep culture of inequality, of treatment for over hundred, uh, over thousand years. So these two principles were the principles that got embedded into our society. Thousand years practice is not a uh, you know easy time. Out of two thousand five hundred years of you know, things agriculture and all these, or 2000. Uh, uh, over 1000 years was rigorously uh, uh, organized throughout the country on the basis of these two principles disproportionate punishment and the, uh, uh, the lack of social mobility. And then we come to the um, um, trying to rush come to the uh, period that brought certain modern concepts. That is after uh, 1815, uh, certain uh, notions of, you know, we, we, we enter the modern age, really, in the colonial uh, times, beginning with Portuguese, Dutch. You know, naturally, people resent so uh, the resentment that we have against them is normal and natural. But that does not should not lead us to understanding the social impact of uh, that period. Socially, it was for the first time that the idea of social mobility enters into modern times uh, in our country, it is with the coming of the, the, uh, these colonial powers because in their society, already that evolution has taken place. They also had similar practices in the past. But due to the period of enlightenment, period of science, a period of improvement of technologies, they could not uh, go on with uh, uh, that kind of dis discrimination. So they got used to uh, new habits where anybody, if they have the talent and the capacity and the wish, can uh, you know, transfer from whatever the position they have had traditionally into a new person. So that possibility of change comes to Sri Lanka only uh, the uh, so that's a uh, um, uh, that's the um, uh, the principle of uh, you know inroads into the idea of social uh, 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 mobility. Uh, there's an argument about Ambekar's uh, uh, point of view on the, uh, the, the, the basis of uh, caste and uh, things on the basis of uh, control of um, uh, uh, Actually, now you know my own specialty is Ambekka. I have written a book on Ambekka, and uh, I have had interest on Ambekka for over thirty years. See, the Ambekka was the first. You know, the, the principles that I talk to you now were best formulated by uh, Ambekka. The uh, 
problem of caste and the problem of uh, female sexuality was very uh, very much deeply uh, linked because again a uh, one group that was completely denied of social mobility was the women women uh, you know uh, uh, were not even in the, in the caste uh, uh, discourse even the uh, if you say a brahmin woman can never be a brahmin even a brahmin family the wife of the brahmin or the mother of the brahmin is not a brahmin he does not have the privileges of a, a, a brahmin the uh, the total uh, what we discuss also in the western discourse the total ownership of uh, the woman by the male by way of uh, you know uh, male controls uh, was uh, achieved in the caste because they were completely denied of uh, uh, any kind of mobility they were denied uh, up to a very recent times given the right of education uh, the marriage uh, was you know, this is not only caste but also understanding many forms of social discrimination in the world you have to finally to go into the issues of sexual uh, 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 control uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, women control of women Uh, because this is an area that is not being uh, uh, brought to the uh, surface enough even in modern times uh, people who are considered to be uh, very top in the the western uh, philosophy like frederick nietzsche his attitude towards the women is not different to uh, uh, that uh, we have in the uh, indian culture Uh, about women they were nothing they were to be nothing they they had no value uh, uh, so controlling uh, women uh, was uh, uh, you know from an anthropological point of view uh, one of the main things that determine many civilizations and this is also uh, an area we find in the indian civilization from an anthropological point of view uh, that is a, you know very uh, 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 something that has to go uh, if you uh, take if you to discuss where to take a very long time at that uh, 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 this thing itself what i am what i was trying to do was to give you a broader outline the, uh, uh, the in the broader outline the five uh, ages of historical development in this country uh the and the, compare it with the foundational notions to find these variations we have a very rich positive original period and then gradual forms of controls and we come to a modern democratic a stage so called democratic stage there we have not resolved most of these problems and in fact we are at the moment retrogressing we are going back so uh, this we could uh, uh, we will uh, discuss uh, in uh, more detail uh, in the uh, coming uh, uh, discussions idea of this uh, one was to lay a broad uh, foundation very broad each of these topics could itself take a very long time but uh, put a broad foundation to discuss other issues where we will come to contemporary problems more you know your, your problems based are more to deal with the contemporary uh, uh, developments we will come to that uh, but this was within the framework of uh, introducing some basic framework for the discussion on human rights but what i want to bring it later is to connect it 
with the whole problem of the poor because the ultimately any improvement in terms of human dignity any improvement in terms of uh, the equality and also liberty if it does not reflect uh, the people who are at the very bottom then it has very little meaning in terms of modern discourse on uh, human rights uh, the earlier generations of human rights people talk mostly about middle class rights i think it is time to bring it down to a more how ordinary person is affected by denial of these foundational principles by development of laws it is in terms of these foundational principles that we must examine our constitutional development and when you look at it from that point of view you see a very different picture to what is being normally presented but unfortunately i have not seen that uh, uh, debate taking place in sri lanka anything else you can ask uh, any questions direct okay if you don't have anything any particular questions uh, you may send us any other uh, questions you have which we can take up at the next meeting and if you have any particular reflections and things like that you can also send so that we can begin the uh, next discussion with the discussion of those uh, uh, your concerns uh, because it's very essential that the discussion be based on uh, the problems you have in understanding and uh, all the problems that you may have come across in your work regarding uh, these issues so you are free to send uh, anything to our address then we will take it up on the next discussion so thank you very much uh we you have a, a series of uh, uh youtube presentations if you just go under my name to the youtube and uh, uh you will find a, a series of uh, human rights related uh, youtubes where uh, many of these things are discussed in uh, more details uh, we will send you uh, uh, also the links to them later but anyone who wants you can go through uh, those discussions in the youtube we will uh, send you a copy of this uh, discussion we will not publish this because this is a private uh, uh, discussion but uh, we will send you a copy so that you can reflect over that and try to uh, further i think a good way to discuss is to raise your questions more so that uh, uh, we can be more focus and go into more depth so thank you very much